Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. We're going to give it a couple more minutes for people to uh, continue to join us, and then we'll start the uh, presentation. <clears throat> Going to give it another minute uh, before we get started. Appreciate your patience. All right, I think we can uh, get going now. Uh, again, uh, most people have joined. Uh, we may have some people joining us late, but we do want to respect your time. <clears throat> uh, my name is uh, Kate Barrett. Um, I am um, the Public Outreach and Involvement Lead for the MassDOT and HMTB team for the Rourke Bridge Replacement Project. Um, we're glad you could join us tonight and we're looking forward to um, hearing your input. Uh, first, we're going to be having a presentation and we'll ask that you um, hold your questions until after the presentation. Oftentimes uh, questions are answered at some point during that presentation. So uh, that would be helpful. I did want to note uh, tonight that the meeting is being recorded. Uh, the reason for that is we want to provide that recording uh, posted on the website so that folks who were not able to join us tonight have the benefit of being able to watch the meeting at a later date. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, participating in the meeting, I think a lot of us are used to Zoom, but some may not be. Um, you all are muted at this point um, to uh, during the presentation. We want to uh, prevent any excessive background noise. Um, at the end of the meeting, we'll have uh, time again for the uh, public questions and answers <clears throat> and comments. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a feature that says Q&A. Um, you're welcome to type in a question or a comment, and we will respond to that. Um, you can also raise your hand virtually, and the way you do that is you go down to the participants um, feature at the bottom of the screen, and you'll see on the bottom right of, of that uh, screen, you'll see a raise hand feature. If you raise your hand, we'll recognize you, unmute you, you can provide your questions or comments, we'll mute you again and, um, and move on to other folks. We do ask that you um, try to limit your initial comments to or questions to one, and we'll do kind of a round robin so that we are sure that we can get uh, to everybody at least once. If you're joining by phone, the uh, star nine is how you raise your hand. And when you do that, uh, we, we will un unmute you as well. Um, if we run out of time, uh, we'll have at the end of the uh, presentation, the uh, project website, and you can always go there at any time, convenient for you and uh, send us a comment or question via the form that's online on the project website. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to uh, invite any elected officials uh, who are here um, to, uh, if you'd like to make any opening remarks, I see uh, Representative Golden, uh, don't wanna put you on the spot, but uh, perhaps you'd like to make some opening remarks or other people would other elected officials, and if you just raise your hand, um, we'll unmute you. 
If you don't have any comments, that's fine too. We can, uh, we'll be opening it up to general discussion at the end of the presentation. All right, oh, I see one, yes. <laughs> okay, Representative Golden. Uh, yes, um, my name is Doreen. I'm sitting in for Representative Tom Golden and I will be taking notes. He may be joining a little bit later. There is another event taking place. It's the Bridge Street um, meeting, which he will, he is on presently, so. Okay, great, thank you. Welcome. Um, I do not see any other elected officials with uh, hands raised, so. At this point, um, I'd like to hand it over to Steve McLaughlin, who's the uh, project manager from MassDOT, uh, to give us some background. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, we've got a, about a 40 minute presentation to, get, to deliver tonight. There's a lot of material to go over. Um, and, and after that, we really do wanna hear your thoughts and your input and your comments on on what we're talking about tonight. Um, you know, we're here to replace obviously the Rourke Bridge and we're studying three different alignments, one, two, and three. Uh, and you'll hear more about them as, as uh, Topher gets into, into the details. Um, what we have realized is alignment two is not going to work very well from an environmental permitting point of view. Uh, so I, I think we want to focus on one and three as, as we go forward. If you want to talk more about two, we're certainly available too. Uh, uh, um, just keep that in mind. Thus far uh, in the project, you know, we have, a, we have a great design team going forward. We've done survey and traffic counts and accident analysis. We've done a lot of homework lately. We've met with a lot of stakeholders uh, and partners, and uh, we formed a working group. Uh, that has local and regional stakeholders and partners. We've met twice. We've talked about this and got their input, which was very good. Now tonight we're going to the public for the first time uh, to, to talk about where we are. And essentially we wanna whittle it down to what alignment do we pick for the bridge replacement. After that, we'll talk about the bridge, not tonight, on an, another future date, we'll talk about the bridge type uh, once we have an alignment, we pick the type of bridge. Is it concrete or is it steel? Where are the piers going, et cetera? And then we'll come back again and we'll talk about the 25% design. And that's where the geometry of the whole project is fixed. Uh, we'll show you what the proposed bridge will look like in, in, a, in a concept phase and all the geometry, the number of lanes, et cetera, how the signals work. And then we'll go out for a design build process and we think that process will take about four years in total uh, once we go out with it. So we're still uh, a few years away. Um, we think the midpoint of construction will be around 2025, 26. And the end game with the final ribbon cutting that we're all looking forward to is around 27 or 28. Um, with that, the alternatives that we're talking about tonight, generally around $130 million dollars. Uh, that we're looking for. And right now we don't have an identified funding source, but we've got to start somewhere. And we've got to, we know we've got to replace the bridge. We've got to pick an alignment. We've got to get it going. Uh, and then funding will, will, will follow and we're working on that. But in general, that's the, the dollar value that we're looking, looking for. Um, now with that, I'm going to introduce a few members of the design team and then um, Stick with us. We've got a lot of data to, to share with you. It may answer the bulk of your questions. And then subsequent to that, let's, let's hear what you have to say. Um, we have Topher Smith is the project manager. He's with HNTB, our lead design consultant. Um, and he'll be opening it off. Uh, you've met Kate Barrett. She's moderating tonight. Mark Kolonowski will talk about environmental issues and permitting and processes. We've got Frank Szynski from MassDOT's District 4 office also here. Um, Deneen Crosby is here to talk about landscape design. Uh, it's a crucial element on this. We want to get the landscape design right. Uh, the esplanade on either side of the bridge, we, we, we certainly want to talk about that. 
Uh, and Ma Maureen Schlebeck will talk about traffic and traffic analysis, which of course everyone who drives over this bridge can experience. So with that, Topher, why don't you uh, take it away? And um, please keep your, um, we'll come back in about 40 minutes after the show is done and open it up for comment. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Topher Smith. I'm from HNTB. And as Steve mentioned, we've got a great team on this project. Along with MassDOT and HNTB, we have McMahon Associates for Traffic, Urban Idea Lab for uh, Bridge Architecture and Urban Design. Steve mentioned Crosby, Schlesinger, and Small Ridge for Landscape Design. We also have a land, uh, lighting design team from Domingo Gonzalez Associates. Uh, Regina Villa Associates for Public Involvement. Epsilon Associates helping us with some uh, environmental services and Welch Associates for survey. All right, the Rourke Bridge is located, located on the western side of Lowell uh, between the neighborhoods of Pawtucketville and the Highlands. It's the westernmost crossing of the Merrimack in Lowell. And the project limits for this project are highlighted on the screen as you can see here in yellow. So it includes the Rourke Bridge, but it also includes a small portion of Pawtucket Boulevard connecting to Old Ferry Road to the west, as well as the Wood Street intersections with Middlesex and Princeton Boulevard to the south of the bridge. Now the design scope is, as Steve mentioned this before, and that right now we're really focused on identifying what that preferred bridge alignment will be. Uh, that's the first, the first item of our scope, the first thing that we need to do and, and our focus tonight. And this is building on the great work that's been done in the past by the Northern Middlesex Council of Governments. They did a, they did a great study and they evaluated a wide range of river crossings to replace the Rourke Bridge. And they narrowed it down to these three alternative alignments that we're talking about tonight. In addition to that, beyond that, MassDOT conducted road safety audits at the intersections that we'll talk about. And this scope builds upon that good work that was done in the past. We'll, we'll identify the bridge type and cross section intersection design at a later part of the design. We'll advance it to 25% design, which is preliminary design. We'll permit the project and advance it to design build. So what have we done so far? So far, we've done our land survey, wetland delineation, and geophysical evaluation. You've probably seen some of our scientists out uh, on the project site, out on the river, out on the river banks, uh, learning about uh, and collecting data from the, from the site location. We've also done some studying of the river and how it behaves, uh, conducting a preliminary hydraulic analysis with how the river behaves and interacts with the existing structure and how it will interact with the future structure. We've also conducted uh, or developed a public involvement and outreach plan, which we're living the first big part of tonight at our, at our public meeting number one. We've also evaluated these, these three concept alignments uh, based on uh, you know, urban design and landscaping, and we've done our homework with regards to environmental permitting. Also, we've conducted traffic counts, and we've done a safety analysis and traffic modeling. So that's schedule, just to recap a little bit of what Steve said. So we've been busy at work uh, doing our data collection. Uh, we've had uh, some legislative and city council briefings. We've had a couple of working group meetings. We've got a great working group on this project. Um, and, and tonight we're having that first public meeting. Again, focus is to give you the status, is to listen, and to talk about the selection of that, that preferred alignment. The second, uh, the second series of the meetings, we're going to have three meetings. Uh, the second meeting will be focused on presenting that recommended alignment. We'll talk about bridge type. That's where we'll start to present some ideas with intersection design and cross section. We'll go back to the drawing board after that. We'll refine further, and then we'll go to a third public meeting where we'll present the recommended bridge type and other project elements. We'll advance to preliminary design through 2021 and 2022, uh, culminating in a public hearing, and then advance uh, advance a RFP document for design build team procurement uh, ending in construction as Steve outlined previously. So the purpose of the project, this is the purpose and need is the framework for which we evaluate these alignments and we'll evaluate other, other uh, project aspects. The project purpose first and foremost is to replace the Rourke Bridge, but it's also to enhance safety and connectivity for everyone who uses the bridge, both above it and below it. So pedestrians, bicycles, 
emergency vehicles. The Lowell General is immediately to the northeast of the bridge here. And watercraft. It's a great river for water recreation and crew racing. Um, and that, that's all in addition to the, the motor vehicles who use the bridge. We're also going to be in, improving the traffic operations at the three key intersections within the, within the project limits. Now, the need, the need for this project is, 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 is well known and documented for anybody who, who, who drives and uses the bridge. Uh, the, the existing bridge consists of, of two narrow lanes with no shoulders for bike accommodations and no shoulders for emergency vehicle accommodations. And it has a substandard uh, sidewalk cantilever to the west side, as you can see in the image here. Additionally, we have inadequate approach intersection capacity. So a lot of the pro traffic problems, as Maureen will discuss, are, are, uh, are, are issues that are happening with the intersections to the north and south of the bridge that are contributing to problems on the bridge. Additionally, uh, maintenance issues. So ongoing deck patching and with a temporary structure of this age, it's actually pretty hard to find replacement parts. So it's a, it's a, it's a maintenance problem at this point as well. Additionally, safety and operations and lack of bike and pedestrian accommodation, not just on the bridge, but also at those key intersections we were talking about. So the Rourke Bridge with Pawtucket Boulevard, Wood Street with Middlesex and Wood Street with Princeton Boulevard all have a history of crash issues and a lacking of bike and pedestrian accommodations that need to be, need to be handled as a part of this uh, proposed design. So let's talk a little bit about these three alignments. As you can see on the screen in blue, orange, and yellow. We'll start with alignment alternative number one. Alternative number one replaces the structure in a similar alignment, in the same alignment as the existing bridge. And so it's right within the same state, state highway layout that was taken in 1983 to build the temporary structure. It results in a T intersection on the northern limit of the bridge with Pawtucket Boulevard. Now, being that the, that the new bridge would be in the same location as the old bridge, this concept would require staged construction. We'd only be able to build a portion of the new bridge adjacent to the existing structure while we maintain traffic on the existing structure. And when that new portion is built, we'll shift traffic and a pedestrian path over to a portion of the new bridge and widen it uh, once we're able to shift traffic over and demolish the existing structure. Alternative number two, it shifts the bridge slightly to the west of the existing structure outside of that state highway layout and avoids uh, the multi-stage construction. This bridge would be able to be constructed in a single stage um, while traffic is maintained over the existing bridge. Also results in a T intersection to the north, so three legs of the intersection. Alternative three, has that same concept as alternative two, but it continues to shift the bridge farther to the west. It shifts it all the way over to Old Ferry Road, and it aligns it so that we have a four-leg intersection. Again, single-stage construction. And with that, I'll pass it over to Maureen Schilbeck, who's going to talk a bit about traffic on this project. Thank you, Topher. As you can see, we have a fairly extensive study area for our traffic analysis we're looking at 14 localized intersections right around the work bridge and 17 additional regional intersections. At each of these intersections, we have collected count data and crash data. Uh, we're using this information to develop both base year and projected year traffic volumes. Uh, we are looking at the traffic patterns in the area. We have spent time understanding the operations and the origins and destinations. And then we've taken time to compare how each alternative affects these intersections. So let me start by talking about the traffic volumes. Uh, we not only project background traffic at a given rate, in this case, we found that the city of Lowell is growing in terms of traffic at a rate of about 0.25% per year. So we did a straight line growth for all the background traffic, but we also took time to identify the planned developments in the area that could influence traffic volumes in and around the work bridge. So you can see some of the planned developments on this map. When we started the project, none of them were built. Um, since then, two have been built. And most notably, the market basket is built. As we go on to the next slide, you can see the type of traffic that we collected at each intersection. 
Our counts were collected in May of 2019, and that is pre-pandemic, so important to note. Uh, and, and at each location, we counted all of the users. So pedestrians were counted as well as bicyclists, motor vehicles, and we identified the heavy vehicles as well. We did take time to go back out just last month and count Market Basket. Uh, really, we wanted to see if the traffic projections we had used from the traffic study for Market Basket were in line for our projections. Uh, we found it's a little bit under generating at this point, which is likely due to the pandemic, but uh, we feel solid with our traffic projections. So you can see from the graphic that the type of detail we have at every intersection of the study area. We also took time to look at the daily traffic volumes, particularly on the Warwick Bridge. And what you can see on this graph is the traffic volumes by hour of day and by direction of travel on the bridge. Now, normally what we see is a, a pretty large spike in the morning peak hour and a large spike in the afternoon peak hour. Um, as you'll note here, we're seeing a spike in the morning, but we're seeing an extended time period in the afternoon with high volumes of traffic. Next, we went on to look at um, the people who are using this bridge and, and try and understand where are their trips beginning and ending. Uh, we're able to use big data sources that are collected from GPS tracking devices, uh, and we can use this data in a number of ways. This graphic is showing you an example where we note different spots for, to, for trips to originate. And we try to understand of the people that originate at the, say, the black dot, how many are crossing the Merrimack River via the Bork Bridge versus the Mammoth Bridge? And you can see the different percentages from the different locations. Uh, so this is a pretty uh, funneled look at it. On the next slide, you'll see we took more of a big picture look at it. Uh, and we looked at traffic analysis zones. And so you can see where the traffic's being generated from the Bork Bridge and, and the Mammoth Bridge. And it pretty much falls in line with as we would think, you're, you're crossing the river at the, at the location that's closest to you. So it seems a little more based on your origin than your destination. Uh, next, we started to look at the safety in the area. We, we collected five years of crash data. Those years covered 2013 to 2017. I do want to note, though, we are aware of the unfortunate situation that occurred recently on Pawtucket Boulevard, where there were two fatalities. Um, and as traffic engineers, it's important for us to see where the crashes are occurring, rank them in terms of the number and the relation to the volume of traffic, uh, and to understand the patterns that we see. And this all informs our design at these intersections. You'll notice on this graphic that there's two in particular, two of our key intersections are highlighted. Uh, so Middlesex Street at Wood, Wood Street and Princeton Boulevard at Wood Street were identified under MassDOT's Highway Safety Improvement Program as high crash locations. So again, we'll use this information to help inform our design. And another way we look at the safety when we're designing these alternatives is to understand the conflict points. As you can see, we have different number of conflict points depending on the intersection design. If we go with a T intersection, we're looking at about nine conflict points. A four-legged intersection, we're up to 32 conflict points. And that's not to say we can't design a safe way to maneuver these 32 conflict points, but as the project progresses and we decide on an alignment, we will then go back and look at intersection designs in even more detail. And there may be opportunities to re reduce those conflict points. Uh, one example is shown here, if we reduce to a roundabout, a four-legged intersection could go from 32 conflict points to only eight. So on the next slide, you'll see it. So now we, we have an understanding of the base year traffic volumes in the future year. We understand what's been happening with the crash history in the area. We've looked at the travel patterns. Now it's time to start looking at the three alternatives from a traffic perspective. Quite honestly, alternative one and two are, to us as traffic engineers are virtually identical. So you'll hear me talk a lot about one, two versus three. Uh, and we'll compare those, each of those to the future no build conditions. And the ways that we'll look at it is in terms of regional travel time. We'll also look at the safety and operational features 
for each of the users on the road. So we're gonna concentrate not only on the vehicles, but also on the pedestrians, the cyclists, and the emergency vehicle access. So on the next slide, you'll see, uh, if we focus on the north side of the river, mostly because the, the alignments differ in how they touch down on Pawtucket Boulevard, uh, the graphic that's to the top and right is reflective of build one and two. And again, you can see the features broken down by vehicles, by pedestrians, by bikes and emergency vehicles. The other graphic on the lower left is referring to the intersection where alternative three meets Pawtucket Boulevard in alignment with Old Ferry Road. Well, when we break it down by mode and we understand what's happening under these build alternatives, in all three situations, build one, two, and three, we're able to design those intersections where vehicles have the added capacity they needed. For example, the westbound left turn gets added capacity. We've improved signal timings, We've designed an intersection where the volume to capacity ratio is less than one, and the intersection levels of service are D or better. Uh, for pedestrians, we have added crosswalks to all approaches and we've included exclusive pedestrian phasing to make it safe for pedestrians to cross at these locations. Uh, for the cyclists, we've added bike lanes both on Pawtucket Boulevard and on the North Bridge. And emergency vehicle access is improved using signal technology. Uh, so when we look at the alternatives, we're able to achieve improvements, comparable improvements for each of the modes of traffic. And the last feature I'd like to speak about in terms of the traffic is the travel times. Thanks, so for next slide, yeah. Um, and in each case, we'll, often these slides will show either AM or PM peak hour, but I, I should have mentioned that we have analyzed everything for both of the weekday peak hours. So when we looked at travel times, uh, we found it useful to look at overall trips in the study area, as opposed to just focusing in on one particular intersection. So for example, if you were on Wood Street near Westford Street and you were traveling northbound over the bridge, turning right on Pawtucket Boulevard and heading up to Barnum Avenue, how do your travel times compare? And you can see those in the red box. So in 2039, if we build nothing out here, that trip takes you about nine minutes. Under build one and two, it's decreased to about six minutes. Build three, it's about seven and a half minutes. Uh, so when we look at all of the trips in the study area, generally build one, two, and three are almost always an improvement against the no build condition. The only time it's not, honestly, is if you're driving Pawtucket Boulevard westbound and uh, your trip's going to get slightly longer. And that reason being is because right now the signals really favor the three movements on Pawtucket Boulevard and to um, elevate those other movements, be it an exclusive ped phase or a minor street turning movement, we have had to take time from the, from the through traffic. Uh, but again, those differences are not that much. So all of the build alternatives overall are better than the no build. And then when we compare build one and two to build three, what happens is trips that are based, say, to the northeast are a little better for build one and two. Trips to the northwest are a little better for build three, just based upon that alignment. Uh, but generally the difference is 30 to 60 seconds and in your overall four to six minute trip, it's not really that noticeable. Uh, so what we found on a traffic perspective is we can design this project under build one, two, and three to be safe, to provide good operations, to provide improved travel times. Uh, and there isn't one alternative in a traffic perspective that really outweighs the others. All alternatives one, two, and three are all major improvements from a traffic perspective. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Deneen to talk to you about the landscape elements. Thanks, Maureen. Um, we've been looking at the different ways that this project can contribute to the city um, and to the adjacent neighborhoods, um, to the character. I think a lot of us, when we think about Lowell, think about the downtown area. It's very imageable. Um, this area where Rourke Bridge is, I think the north side, you think about the parks and the open space. Uh, the south side is a little, a little less uh, memorable. This is going to be a significant new structure and it's going to affect 
the character of both sides of the river, both, both neighborhoods. I think it's also um, to be noted that the city is looking at the Middlesex Street corridor now and placemaking is going to be part of that work. So we want to coordinate our work with the work that is the city is doing so that we have a well integrated project and one that really contributes to the neighborhood and city building that the, the city is doing in this Rourke Bridge area. Um, safe and effective connections. Uh, we have uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities on the bridge and we're thinking about how you get from the bridge or by the bridge to reach destinations. The open space system, there's uh, both a smaller city park neighborhood open space system, but there's also a regional open space system here. Um, the Esplanade, the uh, river trail along the Merrimack River, the state forest on the north side is something that is mentioned in both uh, the Lowell Comprehensive Plan as well as the Pawtucket neighborhood uh, master plan and in fact a connection from this riverfront parkland to the state forest is something that is um, noted and planned there. Now we wouldn't be making that connection as part of our project, but we do need to know about where that's going to happen and how people cross Pawtucket to get to where that connection is. So those are the kinds of things that we have to consider. City vitality is really about people feeling comfortable on the sidewalks and the bicycle lanes and being able to access the river events. Um, the river itself brings a lot of it, vitality to the city. Next. So one of the things we looked at is where can you see this bridge from and um, does it matter which alternative it is. So these are three important vantage points. Uh, UMass Lowell South Campus, the boat club and the esplanade and um, all three alignments are highly visible from all of those vantage points. Next. The experience of being on the bridge. Um, the upper left hand photo is the existing bridge and it's pretty much a straight shot across the river rises a little bit in the uh, middle of the water for clearance and so your focus is on whoever is in front of you when you're driving over this, uh, over this bridge. And that's very similar to the way both um, alignments one and two would be. Alignment three bends as it goes over the water. So if you look at that uh, yellow band that represents alignment three, you can see that as you approach the bridge, you have to bend around to go over. That gives you the greater uh, possibility of having a visual connector, connection with the river itself, rather than just with whoever is traveling in front of you. And the bottom precedent images are just uh, places to gather on the bridge. And you can do this with any of the alignments, um, but alignment three it really sort of sets itself up for that to happen in the landing areas. You can see by looking at that, uh, that yellow band that before the bridge um, turns, it could widen out to be a gathering point on either bank. This is the north bank, but it's a very similar experience on the south. Next. Connecting to recreational uh, facilities. Um, these are important nearby recreational facilities. On the south side, all three land in approximately the same place, so the connections are very similar. On the north side, um, as Maureen was talking about with the traffic, alignment three is farther west than uh, alignments one and two, and so certainly if you're going to the east, they're gonna be a little farther from alignment three, um, but the point is that they can be made in all of the alignments. Next. Multimodal connections. Um, we're looking at existing connections now, walkways, uh, bicycle trails, the lanes that Maureen mentioned on Pawtucket as well as the bridge, the shuttle. But we're also considering plans for the future. There's a, a Sharo plan for Old Faro, uh, Old Ferry Road, um, as well as a, a trail that was noted in the 2013 study from Middlesex heading south. Uh, and the city is, is considering connections for Middlesex Street as well that we need to connect to. Next. 
walking times, um, similar to the information that Maureen presented. If you're walking across the bridge, uh, alignment three is the longest. It's another two minutes to walk from one side of the river to the other. And then if you're heading east, um, if you're going to the boathouse from the south side of the river, it's about another five minutes longer than alignment one. So there are differences, but they're not, um, they're not huge time-wise. Time you can determine whether that's significant in, uh, from your point of view. And on the south side, they're all the same. Next. Crosswalks. Um, we know that safety on Pawtucket uh, Boulevard is an issue. We know about the accident that Maureen mentioned. Um, it's really important that our crossings are places that people are going to use them to access their destinations. So there's an existing crosswalk at the boathouse. Um, there will be crosswalks built at Old Ferry uh, Road, and this is with any of the, the alignments. And then with one, one and two, it introduces a new intersection at the midpoint. So there would be crosswalks associated with that intersection. That being said, with alignment three, it's not that we can't have an additional crosswalk. We're just not designing a full intersection in the locations where one and two are shown on this slide. Next. Finally, the river itself, we want people to be able to enjoy the river activities, whether you're a participant or an observer. Um, we have been in touch with the boating people. We've been coordinating with them and um, all three alignments will work for the boat races. Um, we've also been looking at, right now there's six lanes. We've been looking at increasing that to eight, which would make this um, an Olympic size venue for crew races. So that's something that we hope to be doing. Um, we're looking into doing with any of the alignments. And with that, Mark is going to talk to environmental considerations. All right, thanks a lot, Tanine. We're going to spend a few minutes here talking through some of the environmental considerations that the team is constantly thinking about and uh, is on all of our minds during uh, all the project development. I'm going to start off by reviewing the applicable environmental laws and regulations at both the state and federal level. Just high level, give you an idea of some of the, uh, the regulations, the governing regulations that we will comply with. Then we're going to take a look at the existing environmental conditions and how uh, those conditions are going to have affect our, or have what, what regulatory implications those existing conditions are going to have. Next. So I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, but you can see that at the federal level, there are numerous regulations and policies which MassCOT is re required to comply with. The exact level of review and permitting uh, pursuant to each one of these policies and regulations is not yet determined. Um, we don't know the exact level of impacts uh, associated what, with whatever the preferred alter alternative is eventually determined to be. Uh, but the project is required and will comply with each one of the regulations that you see in front of you here. Next. And again, at the state level, uh, these regulations govern wetland resources, protected open space, uh, minority and environmental justice populations, stormwater, threatened and endangered species, and again, the project is uh, required uh, and is 100% planning on being in compliance with each one of these policies. Next. So the primary wetland resource is the Merrimack River. The Merrimack River is actually elevated control by the Pawtucket Dam, which is located about a mile and a half downstream. Our team of wetland scientists have been out and surveyed and delineated the wetland resources within the proximity of the project area. Uh, we have identified that the ordering vegetated wetlands, uh, again, as a result of the presence of the river itself, are primarily located on the north side of the river. Um, there are no wetlands located on the south side of the river, and that is most likely due to the development and presence of the MBTA railroad probably was not a, a natural condition, but that is the condition that we are working with today. Next. 
So here, all we see is the actual delineation lines uh, that were a result of the field activities. It's a little bit tough to see here on the screen, but the green shapes are the limits of the vegetated wetlands within the project area. And that yellow line there is the bank of the Merrimack River. And both bank and vegetated wetlands are protected resources at both the state and the federal level. Next. We're just going to run through some of the, not some of the, all three of the alternatives and see how they impact both the river and wetland resources. Uh, you can see kind of the piers there in the river. They have a, a pinkish shade and it's that pink color that calls out the location of the impacts. Uh, what's, in, what's interesting about alternative one is while it does have impacts to the river itself by the presence of the piers, it actually does not have, we are, or, no, or at least preliminarily, impacts to any wetland resources on the banks of either side of the river. Next. So alternative two, again, looking at that pinkish or reddish color, depending on what it looks like on your screen. Um, while we're at this level uh, of, of aerial scale, looking down on the project level, um, that larger shape closest to Pawtucket Boulevard um, doesn't appear to be that extensive from this level, but it's actually quite extensive um, when we get down and actually look at the, the square footage of those impacts. Next. And then alternative three, we see a, again, the presence of those piers having impacts to the river itself, and then a sliver of wetland impacts before uh, the crossing of Pawtucket Boulevard onto Old Ferry. Next. And here's a breakdown, um, again, at a preliminary review of what our impacts would be to vegetated wetlands within the project area. Um, not saying that these numbers wouldn't be subject <clears throat> to refinement uh, or, or increase depending on the next phase of project development. But right now, this gives a scale of magnitude as to the extent of impacts of each alternative. Um, as Steve had alluded to during his introduction, alternative alignment number two would be very difficult to permit. Um, it does, I think we can say with certainty, have a extensive amount of impacts. Um, it, it, it exceeds a threshold, which has a significant permitting implication of greater than 5,000 square feet of impacts to bordering vegetated wetlands that kicks that alignment into a, a higher level of review and permitting under the Wetland Protection Act and under the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act. And those processes with that level of impacts has the potential to result in 18 to 24 months extra of permitting review and approval. Next. Moving on to impacts to floodplain, the project is located within the 100 year flood zone. In addition to that, uh, the Merrimack River itself is a regulatory floodway, which is governed by FEMA. Um, showing here, we don't see a great deal of a difference between any of the alignments in terms of impacts to bordering land subject to flooding. Uh, what we're showing here is acres, square footage um, of impacts. The way that these impacts will actually be calculated when we get into the permitting phase will actually be volume. Um, and all of those impacts will be mitigated for. So that is a requirement of the project. The project will not result, is not allowed to result in an impact or an increase to the elevation of floodwaters. And again, the any impacts to a flood zone will be mitigated for. Next. Moving on to impacts to open space and recreation. Uh, as Deneen discussed, there are a number of recreational facilities within the project area. Uh, we have Lowell Heritage State Park, which is owned and managed by the Department of Conservation and Recreation. Edwards Street Park to the south, which is owned and operated by the city of Lowell, as well as the Wang Soccer Field, which is located, uh, you can see there on the left side of the screen. Um, west of a, another municipally owned uh, water facility, <clears throat> um, water facility location. Next. 
These resources are also protected at both the state and federal level. Um, there are three different policies that oversee um, how impacts are governed to, to these resources. They are Section 4F of the U.S. Department of Transportation Act, Section 6F of the Land and Water Conservation Act, and Article 97 of the Massachusetts Constitution. Um, the Lowell Heritage State Park has the unique designation of being protected under Section 6F. It means that land and water conservation funds were actually utilized to purchase um, the, the facility. As such, it is subject to a, an extra layer of review and protection. Um, any impacts to Lowell Heritage State Park would have to be coordinated with the Department of the Interior, the National Park Service, um, and Alternative Alignment 2 uh, is, we know, well outside of the existing state highway layout and would have a significant impact on Lowell Heritage State Park and would require a, uh, an extra level of review. Again, very, very timely um, and, and slightly cumbersome to work through. Next. And here's what I was referring to. And so we can see that alternative two does cut right through Lowell Heritage State Park, thus requiring that extra level of review. Um, alternative alignment three, um, we're, we're working towards um, a solution to possibly avoid impacts to, to designated open space. Um, and then we're gonna look at alternative alignment one here in a little bit more detail, next. And I'm realizing now looking at this on my screen that it's a little bit difficult to understand exactly what it is that we're looking at with the coloration of the lines. But you'll notice the line that kind of comes down in a V and then next back out to go over the river. Thank you very much. Um, that is the existing state highway layout that was identified and determined in 1983 to support the construction of the existing structure. Um, what we are looking at is to see if alternative alignment one could be constructed entirely within that state highway layout. Um, again, um, cannot 100% commit either way, but there's a potential that this inline, the, the inline alternative could be built uh, entirely within that state highway layout and thus avoiding uh, some of those regulatory reviews that would be required under section 6F, 4F in article 97. Next. And moving on, uh, the design team and MassDOT is very much aware of the unique and diverse population of the city of Lowell within the project area. Um, much of these populations actually uh, are eligible for designation uh, under environmental justice policies. And the project team, I think as, as demonstrated through this meeting tonight and the, the Title VI compliant public involvement plan, which we are adhering to, is very much committed to a robust, transparent, open public process to allow all community voices to be heard and participate in the project development process. Um, environmental justice policy requires that a project not have a disproportionate or disparate impact um, on, on, on any people or any population designated as environmental justice. and. Uh, the project itself with the impacts or with the improvements and benefits being where they are, um, we can say with certainty right now tonight that it is not anticipated that the project would result, result in a disproportionate or adverse impact on any populations within the project area, the city of Lowell or the reason, region at large. Moving on. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. With that all, I'll take this back on and we'll talk more about the bridge geometry, a few more items with the, uh, with the three different alternatives before we open it up to folks' questions. So bridge geometry, um, there's some differences between the three alternatives. Uh, one is bridge length. So alternative one and two are about 1,000 feet long, 1,050 feet long from abutment to abutment. And alternative three is about 200 feet longer. Um, additionally, there's likely going to be an additional pier associated with the longer alternative three. And that will come down to which bridge type that we select, but inherently with the longer bridge, uh, longer bridge structure, we're likely to have an additional pier. Um, 
We also, it, it's, it's inherent to alternative number three, there's some curvature, there's some horizontal geometry uh, on, on Wood Street, on the, uh, on the Rourke Bridge itself at the crossing. And so we've evaluated site distance, horizontal site distance for, for those curves, and we're able to accommodate them for the design speed of the project. Um, so that is, that's not an issue there. Um, but one thing that we're looking at as it relates to maintenance and utilities is that there's been a request for a 30 inch water main uh, to be installed as a part of the bridge crossing. And that's, that's, a, large, that's a large utility. Um, so it's relatively straightforward that we can, we can put it on alternatives one and two. We had to sharpen our pencils and look a little bit closer at some of the detailing that might be required to accommodate such a, such a utility on alternative three, but it does appear to be feasible um, and something that we can do. Now, that was our horizontal geometry. Now this, this takes a little bit of a look at vertical geometry. So these graphics that we're looking at here are profile of the bridge or a longitudinal section across the bridge. And the perspective we're looking at is as if you were standing on the east side of the bridge, uh, say at Lowell Heritage State Park or on one of the sidewalks uh, associated with uh, one of the sidewalks of Pawtucket Boulevard, looking west at the structure. And I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. So one is the path underneath the existing structure. And we intend, to, we intend to continue to have that path if possible. Um, there's a pedestrian path in front of the existing abutment and we intend to have that maintained as a part of the, the future design. And I'd also like to draw your attention to the distance between the river and Pawtucket Boulevard between these two alternatives. And we've got two graphics here. We're showing alternative one and two very similarly. Um, and alternative three is a little different. So there's more space inherently between the river and Pawtucket Boulevard for Old Ferry Road. And what that does is it allows, it allows the grade to transition uh, from going over the river, over that path, and down to Pawtucket Boulevard and results in a, in a modest elevation increase on Pawtucket Boulevard, probably zero to one feet. And for alternatives one and two, because of that shorter distance, and if we're to maintain the pedestrian path, and if we are to, the new structure will likely have a deeper structure depth than the existing structure um, to carry to carry the load, and and to and to hold on to having that 30-inch uh, water main underneath the structure. With those things in that shorter distance, it it results in a a higher raise or a, or a higher grade on the proposed Pawtucket Boulevard. So we're evaluating right now, right now this graphic shows up to a five foot grade raise. We're looking at alternatives and ways that we might be able to tweak the design, ways that we might be able to handle the first span on the bridge um, and potentially ways that we can move, relocate that 30 inch water main from underneath the structure to the side of the structure. There's an aesthetic issue with that, something we can look at and think about. So when we put five foot grade rays on here, it's zero to five feet um, and, uh, and, and upwards potentially of five feet. So that's going to require a wall on the north side of Pawtucket Boulevard, which will, which will, uh, which is something that we need to consider. Um, there's, some, there's some constraints with the Bolero parking lot there and access uh, access to the uh, to Bolero there and would be as well to uh, the market basket driveway. We're looking at it right now. Again, it's not necessarily going to be five feet, um, and we believe that there's an opportunity to maintain access uh, to either of those driveways through that. But it, but it's 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 a it's a much larger constraint than that is inherent to alternative three. So now on the schedule. Schedule and we'll get to cost next too. So the timing of the bridge opening. So we talked about a, a, a schedule and it, and it will there will be a range depending on which alternative we select. Um, we're looking at the midpoint of construction likely being around 2025 or 2026. And alignment number one is going to add one year to that because of that multi-stage construction we talked about and those constraints that Mark was talking about earlier when we were looking at the state highway layout. So we need to, we would need to stage that bridge and it would take two major stages to build alternative number one. So we, we add one year to that schedule. For alignment number two, we add two years. Um, and that's, so we, what we gain in, in shifting 
uh, away from the existing structure and building the bridge in one major stage, uh, we also face a little bit of a headwind or a large headwind of the, of the environmental impacts that are associated with that and the permitting that's associated with alternative two. So we had two years to the opening of the bridge for alternative two. And alignment number three would be the uh, shortest path to opening the structure because it is uh, offline construction, major one major single stage. Um, and it also doesn't have those uh, same permitting and environmental implications. And that impacts our cost. Now, when we talk about cost, we're relatively early in the project development process. So there's a lot of things that we're gonna talk about as we reconvene this group uh, moving forward and we advance the design, uh, the width of the structure, the bridge type, uh, the number of piers in the water. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that will, that will change um, over the course of the design and the, and the cost will change with that. When we build more, it, it tends to cost more. Um, so, but for the purpose of making a decision early in the phase, we have established some, some base, uh, uh, base parameters of the structure. To develop the cost that we're presenting tonight, um, we're using an 84 foot wide structure. That includes four travel lanes. It includes buffered bike lanes and sidewalks on each side of the bridge. And we're also using a steel plate girder, steel stringer, simple structure type um, to develop these costs. And we're using it for all three of the alternatives. So we can have an apple of the apples comparison respective to each alternative. And those costs are, are as follows. So we start off by evaluating costs in, in present dollars. Um, and then we need to escalate based on the time that it's going to take uh, to get to construction and execute construction. So alignment number one, in today's dollars is at about $104 million. We need to escalate that by one additional year, by six years at the FHWA recommended 4% escalation rate. That results in $131 million. Alignment number two is at $97 million in today's dollars, uh, but we need to escalate that at seven years, two additional years at that 4%, and that brings it up to $128 million. And alignment number three, that long, longer bridge, um, is $116 million in 2020 dollars, but it needs to be escalated at just the five years um, because it can be built, it can be built sooner. And that results in $141 million for construction cost. Now, we're, we're looking for folks feedback tonight uh, on the, on the, uh, on the project as a whole, but primarily on these, on these three alternative alignments. And when we go back to the drawing board, we're gonna be evaluating these three alignments against uh, a list of criteria. And we've got some potential criteria listed off to the, the right of the screen here tonight. And the things that we're gonna be looking at are traffic operations and safety, uh, how it handles bicycles and pedestrians, emergency vehicle access, recreation on the, on the Merrimack, Aesthetics, the things that Deneen talked about, how we connect and interact with the bridge and how it looks, the environmental impacts, wetland and open space resource impacts, that bridge roadway geometry, including Pawtucket Boulevard, Boulevard corridor access management. So how, how do we access uh, the adjacent properties and driveways and how do those interact with the intersections that we design? Maintenance and utilities, constructability and temporary traffic impacts, schedule and costs. And we look forward to your, to your feedback on these so that we can get this right when we make our decision. And with that, I'll pass it back to Kate to moderate our questions and answers. Oh, Kate, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I'm muted. Uh, okay. Thank you, Topher. So, um, Again, what we're going to do is I think we'll, we'll run through the uh, the uh, typed questions and answers uh, first and then go to raised hands. Um, again, if you want to raise your hand and ask your question or make your comment verbally, it's at the bottom of the screen. You'll see the participants uh, icon. You uh, click on that and raise hand is at the bottom. That will unmute you and let you uh, make your comment or ask your question, then we'll mute you again. And we do ask that you uh, limit your initial comments and questions to one so we can be sure we get to everybody at least one. Um, 
And with that, I'm going to. Um, <clears throat> oh, and if you're calling in by phone, uh, star nine is how you raise your hand. I will ask if you don't have, if you haven't renamed yourself ask you to identify yourself because as is typical with public meetings, we like to know who's uh, attended our, our online meetings. Um, so uh, Linda Barrington had a question about slide 24. What is preemption? That might be more. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Sure. Thank you for uh, asking that. I should have explained it better. Uh, preemption at a traffic signal relates to emergency vehicle access. And generally there's emitters on the emergency vehicles that send a signal to the uh, traffic signal, pretty much saying I'm coming in this direction, give me a green light. <laughs> and then the, the controller will make that happen in the safest and quickest way possible. Thank you. Um, Sean Long had a question. Uh, speaking of bike lanes and pedestrian exclusive signalizing, Bicycle signalizing would also be useful for safe travel through those intersections. So it's just another comment about, uh, you know, what we've been discussing tonight. We have a person who's um, identified as Zoom user. Um, and oh. the question is uh, how the bowling lane will be affected with in and out, uh, within and out of, uh, I guess, travel within and out of the parking lot. Uh, sure, I can handle that. So with the with the driveway and Kate, I think you cut out a little a little bit there, at least on my end. It sounded like it was is how 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 the in and out traffic is uh, impacted for the bowling alley, how the driveway might be impacted. The parking lot, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. So for alternatives one and two, uh, there there would be some impacts associated with that parking lot due to that grade raise. We're taking a look at that and trying to minimize uh, that wall and, and the height of that wall and the transitions for that wall. Uh, but the intent would be to find a solution where we could maintain access to the bowling, either from Townsend or, or through that westerly driveway. And um, with alternative three, uh, it, 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 shifts, it, it shifts everything farther to the west so that that access would be similar to it is today from the uh, from the westbound Pawtucket Boulevard from uh, from eastbound Pawtucket Boulevard you wouldn't be able to hang a left or do a u-turn at where the existing intersection is and so you'd have to accommodate that farther to the east uh, near the boathouse great thank you and I do apologize I actually should have uh, first acknowledged uh, elected officials to see if any of you have uh, initial comments or questions. I know we have a representative uh, from um, Tom Golden's office. We have uh, Senator Kennedy here. We have a city councilor. Um, so if you would like to um, make any initial comments or have questions, uh, we would want to recognize you. So please raise your hand. If not, we can move on to um, other attendees. Okay, we have... Uh, Let's see, Senator Kennedy. Okay. I saw Senator Kennedy, but he's, oh, let's see. I'm not seeing him. Okay. Uh, oh, here we go. All right. Senator Kennedy. You're, uh, you can unmute yourself. All right, am I unmuted? Yeah, you're unmuted. Thank you. The, um, I just would like to talk about the cost a little bit. It seems that, I, I believe we've had three meetings over the past year or year and a half. I, part of the meetings, or at least the first meeting I think was when I was on the Lowell City Council and I've, there's been a meeting probably back in the winter time is my recollection and now. And there is a, a transportation bond bill that is co currently in the uh, conference committee. The Senate version of that, uh, of the transportation bond bill does have a line item for a hundred million dollars for the Rock Bridge. And I believe the house version has language calling for the construction of the Rock Bridge without, um, without a line item. But, and I think when, 
when it was first decided to put the Rock Bridge into that uh, legislation at $100 million, that was what the estimate was. So uh, my question is, um, how firm is are your SDR cost estimates? Is this uh, is 100 million not going to be enough money anymore? Senator, this is Steve McLaughlin, Mass DOT. Uh, let me say we, we are trying to um, always estimate the true cost of, of what this is going to be. Um, and, and I, I got to say, just please bear with us in, in that we don't know where the bridge is going in order, and we have to find a cost and we don't have a design yet. So we right. look at estimates and, and um, we consult experts and we're doing the best that we can. And we're, and we're always giving you the up-to-date information that we have. Um, right now, <clears throat> with the two alternatives between one and three, we're at between 130 and 140 million. Um, and, and so for just to make sure that is escalated out in, in the out year. It is. Okay. So, so that's where we are now. Um, we want to, if the cost changes, we're bringing it to you real time. As soon as we find out, um, we, we share it with you. And, and I do have to say that, um, a while ago when we were going through the consultant selection, I asked the three firms who we were interviewing, what do you think the cost is of a bridge over the Merrimack? And they all knew what I was going to ask it. And, and it was a substantially lower number. But, uh, but I want to say it wasn't an artificial number. It was with the information that we had at the time, that's what we thought it would be. There's been cost escalation and the bridge itself is going to be a, a larger structure just the nature of crossing it and the width of it, providing all of the users we want, um, the, the, the scope has, has increased a bit and we want to get it right. So at, at this point, 130 to 140 is really what we're looking for. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to say too that I, you know, hearing that the bridge was going to be 84 feet wide, I think you said 84 feet, um, which accommodates the four lanes and the bike lane and two uh, pedestrian walkways on either side of the bridge. I, I think is really what you need. I think the last time we, we met, which was some time ago, there was some discussion about whether the bridge should be three lanes rather than four lanes. Um, but I'm hoping that we're not talking about three lanes anymore at all. Is that correct? Um, I don't want to completely remove it off the table, Senator. Okay. Um, what At each intersection, Certainly, it would be two lanes at each intersection. It's it's in the middle whether we need that extra space or not, or could we put it to other use? Um, essentially, we don't want to have unused space. Um, and, and we want to design for the future capacity of the bridge vehicle-wise and, and, of course, pedestrian-wise. And if we could do it with three lanes, then we'll demonstrate that we can and why we would believe that. Um, we're certainly not going to do that in a vacuum, but I don't want to eliminate that as a discussion point. Okay. All right. I, I, that's the only questions that I have this evening. I just want to thank you for doing this. I think that this is important. I know that the people in uh, the greater Lowell area have been waiting for this bridge for a long, long time. And it, you know, maybe the, the light at the end of the tunnel is still far away, but at least that, that people can begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you very much. Or the Thank bridge, you. but at the end of the bridge, maybe is more appropriate. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of, we have some more written questions. Um, I think we've answered this question. Will design interfere with regattas and boat races? Paul Early had that question. Right. We uh, so we have been talking to the boating community. We spoke with uh, UMass Lowell and and some of the regatta associations. We're actually coordinating with them right now to get some additional survey at the bends of the river so that we can make sure that we're right about this. Um, but we've taken taken a look. We have an understanding of their uh, of the parameters of the race course. So six lanes. So the existing six lanes are about 75 feet wide. 
and there's an oper and they're 75 feet wide to accommodate the locations of the existing piers and and absorb some of the width of the existing piers and depending on how we lay out the the pier arrangement for the future bridge there's an opportunity then to potentially go with a little bit narrower lanes and still meet those parameters down to about 45 feet and get smart about where we locate those piers and we might be able to add two additional lanes to make an Olympic course. And we currently think we might be able to do that for all three alternatives, but we are working with folks so that we can go get uh, additional survey at the start and finish of the race course. Great, thank you. Uh, John had a question about whether the Bork, existing work bridge would remain usable and drivable until final completion of the new bridge. Right, yeah, I, can, I can tackle this one too, or? I'm sorry, I saw you oh, on mute. How about this? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Did, did okay. I get that wrong, so? <laughs> that worked. Yeah. yeah. Uh, John had a question about how many lanes the new bridge would have in each direction. I think we just discussed that, so that we should be able to move on from that one. Uh, Carl. Popolo uh, alternative three extends the drag strip for racing down the boulevard. Any plan for speed and noise control? So speed, speed and noise and Pawtucket Boulevard. So Pawtucket Boulevard is a, is a, is a higher speed facility through Lowell. It's a design speed of 45 miles an hour. We understand that people exceed those speeds. Um, as we look into our, into our intersection design and our cross section design for the boulevard, we're going to be taking a look at, at that issue. Um, regardless of which al alignment we select, we're going to be taking a look at that cross section. It's a wide right of way. There's a lot of opportunity there to do good things with bikes and pedestrians and to separate them from vehicles. And there's some opportunity for, for traffic calming. And I think if I'm reading into the question that, that there's a desire for that uh, from that question. And so we're hearing you. Um, as far as noise goes, we are doing a noise study. Our, our consultants from Epsilon Associates have started to develop the baseline noise analysis. And that, that's something that's going to be a part of this project is evaluating noise. Thank you. Um, we have a question about the design, the cost of each design. We did cover the construction costs. I don't know if you want to add to that, how design costs factor into that. So we have the design, it's funded <coughs> for the entire project. We have committed uh, design funding. That, that's where we are. And it's, it's not definite, it, it's for the project, not for a particular bridge. We have to work collectively to get an alignment. Once we get an alignment, we design the bridge. Once we design the bridge, we go out and put it out to bid for uh, a design build team to then finish the design and, and construction. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is a property specific question. It may be something that uh, it needs to be discussed offline or with right of way, but 1815 Middlesex Street, CVS, curious to know the impact on their property. Okay, I can, I can address that in a preliminary phase, at least from with the three different alternatives it appears right now that we're able to stay um, stay away from that property equally, I'll say, between all three alternatives. Even though alternative three shifts towards that property, state highway layout widens quite a bit just behind the property. And most of that curvature happens behind the property to the north uh, towards the river. Uh, right away will be evaluated more as we, as we um, advance the project. Now, like speaking to the improvements on Middlesex Street, uh, we don't know exactly what that is yet, but it would be inherent to all three alternatives. Um, and there may be some strip takings or temporary reasons. Great, thank you. Um, and Topher, you you talked about this a little bit. Uh, some John is concerned about you know boat river traffic being able to clear the bottom of the bridge in the elevations. Boat river traffic clearing the bottom, so that the clearance over the river. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so it's considerably higher on the south side versus the north side, um, and the clearance over the river is not going to change dramatically.
from where it is where it is today. The new structure will be deeper, um, but when we're over when we're on the south side, um, the south abutment is much higher to clear the to clear the MBTA railroad. Uh, the clearance over there is is around 24 feet. Um, it's going to be close to that in the future. Um, and and the new structure will be deeper, but that's still considerable considerable clearance uh, for any any of the boats that would be used in the river. And then on the north end, we are raising it up a little bit. We have to be two feet over the 50-year floodplain, um, so we're not going to be all that different than where we are uh, today in the existing condition. Thank you. Uh, we do have a number of other typed questions. I do want to get to some folks who have their hands raised. Uh, Sean Long, I'm going to. Um, unmute you if you want to go ahead. John, you can unmute yourself. John, I've allowed you to unmute yourself. Oh. I'm, hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, the, the design talks about buffered bicycle lanes. I'm wondering uh, what sort of a buffer that is, because I'm concerned that on um, really high traffic periods, a motorist might intrude into that space. So are we talking a, a physical buffer or just paint? So on for the preliminary costs, um, it, we're including just paint at the time. Okay. And as a part of that 80, 84 feet, that's what we're showing now. Um, but this is a good comment, and this is going to be an important part of the dialogue as we advance the design. Um, we're going to be complying with MassDOT's new separated bike lane guide, guidance, um, and we'll be evaluating a range of concepts um, according to that. And so th this is good feedback at, at this time. Great. Thank you. And again, I just want to stress that we want to keep it to one question or comment per person. So, Sean, I apologize. I've I'm, we're going to move on to Chuck Strickland. If you have another question, Sean, you can raise your hand again. Uh, Chuck, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Uh, I think I did. Is that working? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to, uh, as a resident of Pawtucketville, uh, I've been here a long time, user work bridge. I uh, also a professional civil engineer. The presentation has been great. I just wanted to get on the record, fully support uh, this project and alternative three, I think is really a no brainer. It would be a travesty to spend over a hundred million dollars on what is going to be a long, uh, large structure and not correct the road alignment issues, uh, that require people to take all those turns to get from old ferry, uh, over the river. So, um, I, I what you have presented has been great. I like that. It's a lot less environmentally impact, uh, full than, I thought it would be, and uh, with the cost difference being so uh, so little, um, again, full, fully support alternative three. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeff. All right. Um, so I'm going to go back to the uh, <clears throat> typed questions and answers. Uh, we do have about another. Uh, uh, 22 minutes, um, and we have about 29 questions. So uh, I'm going to try and get to the ones that are new questions um, that we haven't covered in the presentation. Um, let me just uh, run through this. Uh, Tracy Brinson asks, are you considering driver unfamiliarity in the roundabout of the north intersection? along with reduced pedestrian and bike safety. So another timely question on something that, that um, we're gonna be looking at, looking at a range of alternatives for in intersections. It sounds like this, is, this, uh, this person has a concern with, uh, with bike and ped safety associated with, with roundabouts. There are certain things that we can do. Uh, to improve those, it's, uh, we're not inherently, uh, we're not saying that we're moving forward with a roundabout. It's one of the options that we will evaluate and there's pros and cons associated with it. Um, I missed a part of that question, Kate, didn't I? There was something else. Um, sorry. Yeah, there, there's pedestrian and bicycle aspects to and a roundabout. Bicycle safety, yeah. Each one has its own elements. Well, you can remove the traffic conflicts, but, um, there can be issues with bicycles and pedestrians 
specific to roundabouts. And that's what OPA is going to be looking into. Right. Yeah. And the other part was people who are unfamiliar. I'm sorry, I just, just recalled that part of the question. Folks who are unfamiliar with the area. Um, so we would be following the latest and greatest guidance for, um, for signage for a roundabout with advanced signage explaining where, you know, what lane to get into and where to go. Great, thank you. Uh, Vijay Nalamata asks uh, if it's alternative two or three, how will it impact traffic flow, which in turn could affect the retail businesses currently existing? I pass that to you, Maureen, perhaps. Um, yeah, I, I might be reading into it, but is that related to construction, I would think? When we're constructing the project, uh, wasn't clear on the question. So I, 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 well, I guess I can address it both ways. Um, we're not taking capacity away through the retail section, and we're going to do our best to maintain driveways as they are. Um, during construction, there's definitely impacts experienced by all users and adjacent land uses. We do our best to minimize those impacts. Um, not knowing exactly which alternative we're building at this point, it's hard to speak specifically about the construction impacts, but you know, on every MassDOT project, we try our hardest to minimize the impacts. We understand what the construction does to the adjacent retail establishments. And we work hard to minimize those impacts. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Emily has a question. Uh, the renderings show a scenic viewpoint from the sidewalk in the middle of the bridge. Would this be on both sides? Scenic viewpoint. Uh, ah, so perhaps this is from the outlooks. Uh, some of the some of the precedent photos that Deneen shared earlier for some of the the place making and the outlooks. Uh, that is, we we're going to be open to to feedback on that, and that's going to be something that we'll be looking at and thinking about as we start to talk about the bridge type. When we start to talk about the cross section of the bridge. We'll start to evaluate a range of concepts and share those. So. Um, it could be on one side, it could be on both, it could be at piers, it could be just at the abutments. Uh, there's, a, there's a range of ideas we'll look at and we'll share them with you. Okay. Uh, actually, Emily had another question. If bike and ped facilities will extend onto Old Ferry and Wood Street? And if so, is this included in estimates? Yeah. So bike and ped facilities would extend uh, down onto, onto Wood Street. We've had a good dialogue with, uh, with the city of Lowell and I've, I've heard that that's, that's a pretty important part of the project. I know right now we're pretty focused on which alignment, which really puts us right at the river and up on Pawtucket Boulevard. Um, but that will be an important part of the project that we'll look at and we have included uh, bike lanes and sidewalks uh, included in the cost currently. And then as far as old ferry road goes, um, we, we would only be extending work on Old Ferry as far as needed to tie into, tie into the intersection improvements that would be made there. Uh, I believe currently there's a Shero that's included on that roadway as a, part of, as a part of the market basket upgrades that were done to the intersection. And we, may, we may put short, short runs of bike lanes there, but it's going to be limited work that happens on Old Ferry. It's right at the limit of our project. Great, thank you. Uh, Raymond just wanted somebody to speak a little bit to the improvements that are envisioned for the intersection of Wood and Princeton. Okay. That is something that we're going to evaluate and, and share a in a little bit more detail moving forward. Um, we've been reviewing the road safety audits that were done and we'd be taking the recommendations that were made there into account as we advance the design. I don't know, Maureen, if you have any more to elaborate perhaps on that, on some of the low hanging fruit from the RSA that we might be accommodating. Right, well, I mean, I think one point to make too is that um, that's not a differentiator in picking the alignment because by the time we're reaching that point, all three of those alternatives are, are touched back in the same position. So uh, as Topher said, we will look to improve those intersections. At this point of the project, we're picking an alignment and then we're going to really dig deeper into the intersection designs. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take two more questions um, that are written here. Um, Robert asks if the uh, um, 
Vandenberg Esplanade walkway in the North Shore, will it be expanded to continue the walking path along the river to the new bridge or will the walkway follow Pawtucket Boulevard along the street to get to the entrance of the bridge? There's, there are some options there. Um, right now we're evaluating putting it uh, closer to the roadway. We could see the, the desire to have it closer to the water, um, but we need to be cautious uh, with, the, with the scope of this project and, and any impacts associated with that, that open space. Um, Steve, I, 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 well, there, I, can, I don't know if, if, I can, if I can add to that, um, the sections that you showed in, in our efforts to try to let, still allow for crossing under the bridge has to do with the potential for the future expansion of that walkway. So um, we're doing everything as, that we can with our project not to preclude the esplanade from extending um, at some point. Is that fair to say? It, it is. And we, we want to enhance the esplanade to the extent that we're able to, given the geometry of the proposed bridge. The bridge has to touch down somewhere. And when it touches down, um, we, we need to make sure there's a clearance available so that people can get under it if it's physically possible. On the other hand, um, we don't want to impact natural resources as a result of doing that. So there's a balance that we're struggling with with each alternative at four locations, essentially. So we will enhance it to the extent that we are able to, given that we don't want to impact natural resources. And, you know, Deneen, hold us to this. We want to get this right. So. Great. Thank you. All right. One more question, which is actually probably on a lot of people's minds. Will there be updated traffic studies after COVID-19 and before final design? Let, let me. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Let, let me start, Maureen, and then, and then you can um, uh, uh, go after it. Um, what would it show us at this point other than a reduction in traffic? And, you know, it's, traffic hasn't recovered and it's not recovering for the foreseeable future. Um, so if we did another study, what would we end up with? Possibly a smaller bridge with less lanes. And then if traffic recovered, where would we be? Uh, so I'm, I'm a little cautious about, about doing that. M Maureen, if you have anything more polished to say. Right. I, well, I just wanted to remind everyone that our base year traffic counts were pre-pandemic. They were in spring of 2019. Um, and, and what we've been seeing in Lowell is an increase of traffic of like 0.25% per year, which is a pretty low growth rate. So even if we're two years later, three years later, and we came back to bold traffic volumes, the growth is pretty small. Um, we will do spot counts as appropriate. You know, as I said, we already went back out to Count market basket to make sure we we're on target there. So at, at specific locations, there's a chance we go back out and recount, but the entire count program, it really wouldn't make sense to recount it as we move along. We, we feel really confident with our base year volumes. We feel really confident with our traffic projections and, and that will inform us to make good decisions in this project. Great, thank you. Uh, Topher, is there another slide after this? website address and there is all right so we have run out of time doesn't mean the end of your ability to uh, give us your feedback and ask questions um, you can visit the website there's an online comment form you can submit that to us and we will respond um, the uh, presentation is actually already on the, the website available if you'd like to take a look at it again. <laughs> the recording uh, of the meeting, tonight's meeting will be posted as soon as possible. Um, and with that, I'd just like to thank everybody for your feedback and your participation. It's an ongoing conversation. We look forward to meeting with you again. And Steve, would you like to make some closing comments? I, I would. Uh, thank you all for your participation tonight. We're going to go over all the written comments here. And if you have any more, please do send them into the website. Um, it really, the, the more feedback that we get, the, the better we're going to be here. Uh, we will be back 
once we select an alignment, we're going to look into the bridge type, whether it's a concrete or steel bridge and how many piers. And we'll be back before you then. We'll be working, continue to work with the uh, working group that we have. And then after the bridge type, we'll, we'll talk about the 25% design and the final geometry before we go into the design build section. So we'll see you several more times before this is over. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.